So here's our map of France again. And as we look at it, we can go back to our regional map. The first emergence of the, of the uh, leadership family of Eleanor are the Counts of Poitiers, and you see Poitiers right there on your map. Uh, and it will be, of course, this uh, leadership and this family. I'll show you some uh, genealogical tables in a second. But it'll be here that this new power will emerge. And this is just exactly the moment when there's a Duke of Normandy emerging and a Duke of Burgundy emerging. So the, the, the pieces of France that are being ruled by those under the king are emerging right now, 900 and 1000. And one of them is Aquitaine. So the Duke of Aquitaine by 900 will control about one fourth of that southwestern part, the Duke of Normandy part of the north and then the Duke of Burgundy on the east. So here then is our image of the southwestern part. We know that that's the great uh, river. Uh, if we just look at a nice little uh, topographical map, you can see the mountains and you can see what the countryside is like and you can see what a distinct unity it has. It, it had built into it geographically uh, a unity which was beneficial to the dukes. So you have the south border are the Pyrenees, and there lots, lots of sections are impassable. So you basically have a fence on the south side of your dukedom. You have a watery fence on the west, because it's water out there. You have mountains, high mountains on the east. And that's the part of France called the Massif Central. Very big high mountains that go up to 5,000 feet or so. That protects you on the east, because they're very hard to get through. So traffic into your dukedom or out of it come from very, very obvious directions. Southwest corner around the Pyrenees, southeast corner around the east side of the Pyrenees, or from the north up in Paris. And that's the territory. There's the Duke of Aquitaine's great territory. And if we look back at our larger map, you can see the river is at the center of it. We talked about this last time. The Garonne, the great Garonne River, which drops down out of those mountains that we just saw. All of these rivers are feeding west out into the Atlantic. There's the main one, the Garonne, which, of course, will uh, nourish all those vineyards. And we mentioned the vineyards that go back 2,000 years. They've been there since Roman times. Already the Romans had found out what a great place this was. All of this was the territory of, of Eleanor, of our Eleanor. And that's the grand old uh, clock tower gate into Bordeaux. So... This is the place where the culture of courtly love will be born, especially those two cities, Bordeaux and Poitiers. And if I put up a genealogical chart of the Dukes of Aquitaine, William I, who is first Count of Auvergne and then later Count of Poitiers, is the beginning of the uh, family. William III is Count of Poitiers, and his dates are to 963. And then William IV lives to 995. William V lives into the 10 hundreds. Uh, William VI, they were all so smart, weren't they, to all be called William. I think that's a very good idea. <laughs> it's such a nice name. William VI and seventh. And then if we move to the next picture, uh, it continues into seventh, eighth. And William the Ninth is the grandfather of Eleanor. William the Ninth, on your picture up there, Count of Poitiers, is the uh, grandfather of Eleanor, Count of Poitiers, and then his son will be Duke of Aquitaine, and his granddaughter will be Duchess of Aquitaine. Um, William the Ninth is a fascinating person in our story here tonight. Here's a very nice little picture of him. There's the wonderful uh, dialect Occitan of the Southwest, uh, Guillaume de Poitiers. Um, is not only uh, grandfather of Eleanor, but he's also the first troubadour poet. So he's the beginning of the line, he's the beginning of the family in the sense of the Dukes of Aquitaine, and he's the beginning of the troubadour poetry. That is, he's the first person for whom we have some surviving poems that are obviously troubadour poetry, courtly love poetry, uh, the beginning of, of our whole subject here tonight. All starts with him. So the territory, the family, the granddaughter, the poetry. It's all starting with him. So when we investigate 
why it's here and what it is and how it came about, we go back to William the Ninth. But we, we go back to see about William the Ninth and what it is in his life that's important and how exactly his story helps us explain the story of courtly love. Now, one of the things in his life, uh, Aquitaine, the family, Bordeaux and Poitiers, uh, and Troubadour poetry, uh, is also the Crusades, are the Crusades. Uh, and we know the Crusades are very important in this story. We don't know exactly how. We don't know exactly names and exact moments and times, but we do know that this phenomena of courtly love appears in, in exact uh, parallel to the Crusades, to the time zone of the Crusades. The first Crusade is 1099, and we know that the Pope who preached the Crusade, Urban II, came to Bordeaux and visited with Aquitaine, visited with William, and asked him to come on the First Crusade. Uh, so it, it was already linked to him and to his territory when the First Crusade was being planned in 1099. We know that his granddaughter, because we talked about it last week, Eleanor, went on the Second Crusade. So we know it's directly connected. And we know that her son is the most famous crusader of all, Richard the Lionhearted, in the Third Crusade. So there's, there's three connections to three crusades, 1099, 1147, and 1190. So we know that France, southwestern France, Eleanor and her family have a connection to the crusades from the very beginning. So therefore, the questions in front of us tonight are, how exactly did the crusades contribute to courtly love? And the answer are the following answers. Uh, number one, it means that Europeans go away from Europe to far eastern lands in large numbers for the first time since the fall of Rome. So that's the first thing. So, so just the sheer travel story here is major. That hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of European men, mostly, almost all, but including Eleanor and her girlfriends, uh, <laughs> went on the Crusades, went to the east part of the Mediterranean, went to the Holy Land, went to the surrounding territory, and then came back. And they were gone usually one, two, three years. So, so very significant experience of maybe Constantinople, maybe Antioch and the other cities. And then they came back. So that's the first thing. Just the... the connection, cultural connection of Europeans to the Far East and to Eastern Mediterranean cities, un unlike anything that happened before. So that's the first thing. So if ideas, things, cultural ideas were going to be carried around, this would be a time it would happen. So that's the first thing. We certainly think that the phenomena of the Crusades contributed to courtly love by virtue of carrying back to Europe ideas, one of which is surely the idea of the Cathar interpretation of religion, or now we always refer to it as the Cathar heresy. C-A-T-H-A-R, the Cathar heresy. Uh, there's a great book about this called The Perfect Heresy. <laughs> it's a wonderful book. I'll send you a connection to it after our lecture tonight. Uh, so, so that's one of several pieces that would have been carried back to uh, Europe by the Crusades. Now, the second thing is the social disruption that the Crusades brought about. What kind of disruption do we mean? Well, during the period of the Crusades, hundreds, thousands of important arist aristocratic leaders in Europe, high-level dukes, counts, barons, and other leading figures, left home for lengthy periods of time, uh, years. One, two, three, four, sometimes 10 years. Now, in each case, when they left, somebody had to take over and run their territory for them. And in most cases, the person they chose to take over was their wife. So this period of the Crusades is a period of extraordinary, unprecedented moving forward into roles of leadership of women unlike ever before, ever. 
period. No, no previous example. Not Rome, not Greece, not Israel, not India, not China. 12th century Europe, particularly, because that's three crusades, almost the turn of the century, almost in the very middle and almost the very end. So three times for many years, maybe 10 in some cases, and then of course men went there before the crusades or after the crusades. States, important states like Aquitaine and others, would be left in the hands of the wife or mother uh, to run. So part of the 12th century story of courtly love is a unique arrival at power, a unique moment in European history when large numbers of women, and, and when I say large numbers, I mean hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, most likely thousands, but certainly hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of important women who are duchesses or countesses or baronesses who take over and run the manor, the county, or the dukedom. And we know specific people. So, for example, one of the most interesting is Eleanor's daughter, the Duchess of Champagne. And her husband goes away to a crusade and leaves the, the, the county of Champagne in her hands, in all the champagne she left in, he left in her hands, <laughs> so she could have champagne parties every morning. <laughs> um, and she ran the place. She ran the place. And then her son went too, so a bit later, and so she took over again. So the Countess Marie of Champagne is a woman who has significant power for lengthy periods of time, and she's a good ruler, she's a successful ruler, and therefore her life and her story is a great example of a courtly love lady in charge of her state. So, the Crusades have a number of effects on Europe. Number one, intellectual uh, books, ideas, heresies, and other things are carried home. And there's a social disruption. So that's just two of the possible ways in which the Crusades lead to courtly love. And William is right in the middle of it. He does go on a later crusade. And uh, his daughter, granddaughter, is very involved in it. She goes. And then great-grandson Richard, he goes. So direct members of this team, of this family, are there for the crusades and participate in them. And we know that Eleanor went because you heard all about it last week, that she went uh, against her husband's advice. You know, Louis said, oh, no, no, you're not coming. And she said, oui, 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 <laughs> je viens. <laughs> she came and she went and then she came back. And she went with Louis. So uh, her story and her family's story and the story of Bordeaux and Aquitaine is directly connected to the Crusades. Her son, Richard, is the most famous crusader of all time. And all of these individuals and all of their connections brought home here to her territory, to her ooh, 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 uh, to her Bordeaux and to the valley of the rivers, the beautiful rivers that run through her territory, running out ooh, 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 that run out to the, to the Atlantic and uh, irrigate the beautiful fields, which you see there on the, uh, on the picture, and, of course, uh, uh, help grow the wine. So, isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that's Saint-Étienne, that beautiful city I showed you before. So, this is the world that benefits from the family, from its longevity, from its connections back to Charlemagne, from being close to Spain, and from being involved in the Crusades, and therefore having this strong effect upon the family and the, and the locality.